Well, welcome everyone. I'm Art Kaplan from the Division of Medical Ethics, and I think we'll have an interesting roughly an hour for you. Uh, I've got a uh, guest that I'm going to spend a little time interviewing uh, this afternoon, and then we'll hopefully have some time, too, for some of you to ask a question. And by the way, a question is something that ends in a uh, questioning manner, not a speech. So if you have questions, uh, we'll, we put some mics out there and we'll have some time for that too. Uh, so on my, my right is uh, Bob Montgomery, who uh, has been uh, someone that I've been aware of his work in transplant for many, many years. Uh, I've been interested in ethical policy questions around transplant for a long time, and I was well aware of what he was doing at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, pioneering a variety of procedures, and I never expected that I would have the uh, privilege and honor and opportunity to get him here. So he's been at NYU for, what is it, two years now? Almost three. Almost three. Yeah. Um, and uh, lots of interesting uh, ideas and uh, plans coming up in that uh, transplant field for us, growing transplant uh, rather quickly, and we may get to some of those future things, but what really brought many of you here was that uh, as a transplant surgeon and one of the leading transplant surgeons internationally, he himself underwent a heart transplant. And uh, that just seemed to both him and me an interesting opportunity to talk about it uh, with the NYU community, uh, having an opportunity to see things from the uh, provider side, the pioneer side, and from the patient side. You don't get that all too often. Uh, so just a great uh, chance to uh, uh, get perspectives and hear from someone who uh, I think will have a lot to teach us and tell us about. Uh, I too have been the victim of NYU medical care recently. Some of you know I had a, a knee replacement. I've been uh, hobbling around and I have to say that no one has asked to interview me. <laughs> I'm but, the sick one, he's the well one. <laughs> but there we are. So uh, let's get uh, underway and go more to the uh, start of the show here. So Bob, tell us a little bit about your background. What I'm interested in is what led you to uh, take an interest in transplant. Well, so, um, I think if I had to point to one thing, it was probably my father's illness when I was in my early teens um, that is the same disease that I have. Um, and the almost two years that I spent in the hospital while he was slowly dying, and the possibility of a transplant for him, heart transplant. But he was too old, he was 50 at the time. So, but it was discussed, and it, it intrigued me. And what disease did he have? Cardiomyopathy, familial cardiomyopathy. What is that? It's, um, m most of the people in the room are medical, but I won't assume anything. So it's, um, it's a disease of the heart muscle, as opposed to the coronary arteries. So normally when we think of heart disease, it's because of a blockage of the coronary arteries. This is actually, um, a myopathy, so the muscle deteriorates over time. And is it from a virus, or what? It can be that? from a virus, but in my case, it's genetic. It's you know a single mutation, single gene mutation, that we know. And is that impacting all of your family? It is. Yeah, I've got two children who have it. I've got two nieces who also have it. So, it's in the next generation, which is really hard. So you've got this killer disease. Uh, did it? Did it ultimately cause your dad's death? Yes, so he died um, over a period of, you know, kind of slowly, had an arrest, was in a chronic vegetative state for a period of about six months. He got resuscitated, but unfortunately he was brain injured. Uh, tough, very old. And then I had a brother who, and at the time they thought it was probably a viral myopathy. And then when I was an intern at Hopkins in surgery, uh, one of my brothers dropped dead. At Just 35. Out of the he was water wow. skiing and yeah, no, you know. No symptoms, no signals. Nothing before. Wow. Yeah. So were you a Baltimore kid? No, no, I, I was originally from um, Buffalo, New York. 
And um, then my dad got transferred to Philadelphia, his job. And so, like most of my high school years and that sort of thing, I was in Philadelphia. So um, you wound up uh, uh, going to Hopkins. What about uh, growing up, you know, I don't know where, how old you were when your dad died. Yeah, so I was 15 when he, when, you know, he finally died. And did that drive you towards starting to think then about medicine? Well, I, you know, like I said, I spent so much time with doctors and in hospital that um, I think, I, I mean, I, I think it's, like some of us can point to, you know, a patient that we interacted with or something in medical school or whatever that, or a mentor, it's usually a mentor, isn't it, that drives you towards a particular field. But I would say that, you know, I started to kind of gravitate, I um, started to work uh, when I was in high school in an immunology lab, sort of in my off hours and that kind of thing. So it was all kind of moving in that, that direction, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, tell me about mentors. Did you have any in high school and college? Yeah, of course, we all have mentors. Um, I had people who influenced me directly and then people who um, were like powerful forces in my life that I barely knew, like Tom Starzl, who was the sort of the father of transplantation, who I finally, you know, years later got to know very well before he, he died last year. And um, then, sure, in medical school um, at Hopkins during my surgical training, I mean, John Cameron was the guy, you know, when it turned out that I had this disease. I was a second year resident when we finally, you know, determined that I had it. And um, they told me that, you know, basically my surgical career was over. I should look, you know, either for something outside of medicine or um, something outside of uh, surgery. And they said that because? Well, because I, I needed to have a defibrillator place, which at the time I was the first surgeon in the world to get a defibrillator, so they didn't think that that was compatible with being a surgeon, basically. But John Cameron said, let's see, let's try. Were they worried about a shortened lifespan? I think that and um, also, you know, if something happened in the operating room, there was some concern that that the device, which was very primitive then, which was planted in my abdomen, it was like the size of a Pepsi can, um, might go off um, because of some of the instruments that we use in the operating room that generate electrical noise that might pick up as, you know, a heart dysrhythmia. So there were all those, I actually went to a cath lab uh, after I got the device and we used all the instruments in the operating room while they were monitoring me and, you Just know, discovered that, um, it didn't interfere. So. Wow, wow. Do you think that early experience gave you more empathy, less empathy, or indifference to sort of patients facing serious illness? Well, so I've been a patient my whole life. Yeah. Right, so, that, so I was talking to somebody, another faculty member recently who um, has been um, being treated for cancer, and we were talking about our experiences, and they're a bit different because in her case it was a sudden like she was a doctor and then she was a patient. I've been a doctor and a patient for decades, right? So th those two roles kind of developed alongside of each other. Mm. But I would say this experiment, this experiment, this experience with the heart transplant changed that even more. I mean, it was like, you know, the crescendo. Met your spouse where? Um, so, Denise uh, Graves, um, who I've been married to for 10 years now, and we've been together for about 14 years. Um, she and I met on an airplane. She's an opera singer, so uh -huh. I didn't know anything about opera, so uh, it, it's about as distant as. And you just happened to be seated nearby? Yeah. By accident? Wow. Yeah, so I, I had noticed her um, when we were uh, in the terminal, um, and she had a one year old child, Ella. Um, and um, I watched them sort of play together, and I was completely like one of those things where, the, you know, you see the light around the person and everything. <laughs> and then, um, so I got over that pretty quickly and sat down um, in my seat, and I saw her walking down the aisle. And I'm one of those people that always, like, you know, the clown comes over and sits next to me, but she um, uh, 
He's not talking stepped about in, me, by the way. Stepped into the, um, the row and, and said, today's your lucky day. Really? Yeah. Was that your line? <clears throat> It's true. She no, she that? said that. Yeah. Oh, okay. She said that. No, okay. she was referring to the fact that she had this one-year-old child in her arms and that it was probably not going to be what I had envisioned the flight would be for me. But it Got turned it. out it was true in many levels. Now, when you met, she must have learned fairly quickly, I would imagine, that you had this underlying condition. Yeah, but she didn't understand it. Mm. And I was like, I, you know, leveraging technology um, over the past 30 years, I've been able, I had been able to live a very normal life mm -hmm. and look pretty normal to the point where a lot of people in this room probably never knew. Um, but I, it, that was punctuated by some, you know, near death experiences over the years, dropping dead, you know, and getting Resulted shocked. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, she didn't know what any of it was, and I often say she didn't know what she was uh, buying into, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. she's an amazing person. Uh, let's go back to your uh, mentor, who I knew a little, not in the same way you did. Tom Starzl, for those of you who don't know, was a real giant of transplantation, <laughs> uh, started at Colorado, went to Pittsburgh, uh, was, I guess you could say, the pioneer of liver transplantation. Uh, I spent some time with him at a place called the Old Original Hot Dog Stand, which is famous to Pittsburghers for its French fries, which induced the need for transplants. And uh, we would talk. Liver and, and, yeah. heart, <laughs> and we would spend a lot of time talking about transplant issues. He was a pretty dynamic, brilliant guy. How did he shape your view of transplantation? I mean, I, he, was, he was a pioneer, he was an innovator, he took risks, he saw the world differently. These were all things that appealed to me. A few of my friends know that my second grade um, teacher wrote on my report card, Bobby doesn't think the rules apply to him. Ah. And um, I didn't do very well, and I, I was in a Catholic school, the nuns didn't like me, because um, I, I, I I spent most of the time standing in the corner with my <laughs> back to the other students. But anyway, you know, that um, this, I was heavily criticized by the nuns um, for that sort of behavior. But in the end, it, I think it is what served me throughout my career so well. So in a way, you were drawn to Starzl. <clears throat> I was yeah. drawn to Starzl because he was a kindred spirit. Uh -huh. um, um, my contributions have been nowhere near the magnitude of his. but. Um, you know, I think we've both um, uh, taken risks. We've done things differently. We both have black spouses. Um, you know, he, he at a time when, you know, that, that really wasn't something that was often done um, in a place like Colorado, Denver. And um, so, I don't know, there were a lot of connections. Now, did he... Uh encourage you in terms of saying you've got the skills, you have the intellectual ability, to, or was he more? Yeah, you know? no, he, he, um, he was very interested in, in what, I, what I was doing um, at Hopkins, very Did interested. Did you write with him? No, no, but he, you know, invited me um, to uh, Pittsburgh. Um, we spent like a, a better part of a weekend together. Um, he, he, he was, uh, there's a hilarious story. I went, I was so excited, you know, to, to go and I bought a new suit and everything got all ready and a limo picked me up at the airport and we drove past the hospital. I said, you know, isn't that the hospital? And they said, oh yeah, but that's not where Dr. Stars is. And so they went to this pizza hut and they pulled down this back alley and there was steam coming out, you know, from the pavement and everything. And it looked like I was going to do a drug deal. And the driver stopped and said, okay, this is Dr. Starzl's office. And it was a garage. I said, well, what are you talking about? And his assistant comes out and, and, and greets me and we go through this big steel door and up like four flights of steps. And she says, are you okay with dogs? I said, yeah, I'm fine with dogs. So the door opened and there were these two dogs standing at the end of the hallway and they came running at me and almost knocked me over. Starzl comes out, you know, he's all excited. 
yeah, I've got some new ideas I want to talk to you about. We sat on the couch. This couch was like real low to the ground. And I'm sitting there, and the dog comes in between my legs. It has a Frisbee in its mouth, and it starts salivating. And the, the salivation, the drops are dropping down in my groin. And, um, and Starzl is just talking as if this is completely normal. And I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I grabbed the Frisbee, and I threw it, and it bounced off three of his walls, hit a picture of King Fod, and, you know, and Starzl, and the dog jumped up and grabbed it. So, you know, they put him in the pizza hut. It's a good thing you hut. got it off your groin, I would say. Yeah, exactly. They put him in the pizza hut because he didn't fit in. Right? He didn't fit in. And, and that's what I loved about him. I sort of remember, did he have a giant sword or scimitar or something in there? Remember the picture of King Fod? Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember seeing somebody that. Somebody had bestowed on him from They Saudi might have Arabia. made him remove that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let me ask you this. So you get that Catholic background, I got to ask, religious, not religious, spiritual? Spiritual. Yeah, I got kicked out. So, you know, I, I was in a public school at a pretty early age, and that suited me. I'm familiar with that experience. I grew up in Framingham with lots of Catholics, and they, we used to say the, uh, they sent us the worst of the licks to the public school. So. You got bounced over to public school, and that's where you were. Yeah, right. but family was religious. Not yeah, my religious. mom was uh, was a, a really strong Catholic. My dad was Presbyterian, and he just said, "Okay, you take care of this. I <laughs> got <Into that. laughs> I got this." Yeah. What did he do, by the way? He was an engineer, a mechanical engineer. Did a lot of aerospace stuff. He was involved in some of the guidance systems for the early Gemini program, sort of thing. Super smart guy. Well. So we're chugging along. You're uh, doing pretty well, aside from periodic death. Uh, and at some point, somebody is going to say, you know, it's time for you to start thinking about a transplant. Actually, they, nobody did that. Um, you know, it, it just, like, it just, you know, the voice um, couldn't have been stronger. And it was very sudden um, in September. I was at a meeting in um, Italy, <coughs> and um, it was at the end of the meeting, and um, uh, we were in the hotel room, my wife and I, and kind of most people had left, um, and there was a you know, stone floor, and I was sitting on the bed, and I felt um, ventricular tachycardia. Um, I felt the palpitations. And I said, Rapid Denise, I, yeah, I, I'm yep. very aware. And fell over, landed on my face, blood everywhere, mm. stopped breathing, you know. Denise is standing there looking at this scene. And then got shocked, came back. And then it happened three more times over a period of about four hours. This is all in Italy. All in Italy. So it happened again in the hotel room. Then they took me by ambulance. This tiny little um, hospital in the middle of nowhere. And um, I became aware very quickly that I knew more about this disease than anybody in the hospital. But it happened twice when I was in their emergency room. They wanted to keep me, I think, forever and do all these things. I said no. The next morning, I signed out AMA, got on a um, uh, Hold on a here commercial. a second. You signed out AMA? Yeah, yeah. You know what okay. that is? Tell them but, what it you is. Know, I, it, it, against medical advice. <clears throat> but what I loved about it is, you know, the, the, the Italians are so compassionate. You know, that, that's, if anybody, where's Massimo? I'm sure you've had, Massimo's Italian. I mean, this experience is, it's, I've had it over and over again. One time I got in a big fight with my wife in, in Italy, and they made sure that she didn't run away and everything. They're very, like, compassionate people. So they were really upset that I was going to leave I was on a drip, uh, amiodarone drip and everything, but, but they wanted to make it okay. So I had called one of my friends who was on his way back from the Mayo Clinic who, who was in Rome, and he came back, and they gave him loaded syringes of amiodarone, epinephrine, um, all these uh, drugs to resuscitate me, left an IV in me, um, gave, gave him like a mask, you know, and, um, I just thought that was extraordinary, you know. And in the U.S., you would never do that. Somebody signs out AMA, you're like, 
Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, okay. But they, they wanted to make sure it was going to be okay. So I flew back. I met with the um, heart team. I, I got to ask, you're <clears throat> flying on the plane. Uh, people are looking at you. Uh, you got well, uh, no, I just look like that. anybody. No, normal. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, my face was messed up, but that could have been anything. Right. right. So you uh, head back here, and have you phoned ahead saying, you know, get ready for me? Or what's no. going on? Nope. No, I got back, and um, I think I talked to Bridget and said, it's time. It was so clear, you know. I thought this was going to be years down the road. Bridget is? Is um, my partner for um, 18 years. He's the administrative director of the uh, transplant program, and, you know, we work together. She's also my psychologist. And, um, Hold on a second. What did you think when he called? I didn't want him to go to Italy in the first place. You didn't want him to go to Italy in the first place. He went uh, against uh, well, your so Well, right? so that, you know, so there was something that had happened a year before when I was in Argentina hunting up in the Andes, and I collapsed up there and had a pseudomonas pneumonia. So, so we're going to say that so far the underlying condition has not restricted your travel or your no. activities. No. no. And you wouldn't I let mean, it? that's, no. Mm-hmm. Not a chance. Mm -hmm. um, that's the point. And I've got, you know, all these kids and nephews and nieces who are watching me, you know, who are looking at their future. And, you know, I, they need to know that it's going to be okay and that you can live a normal life. All right, so we're back here. What are we in now? Still September? September, yep. First week in September, so. And you know something about transplant? Bridget, like, as she normally does, you know, got all, everybody together very quickly and met with the heart team, and um, I told them what happened. They said, oh, shit, <laughs> you know, and agreed that it was time. Um, Dr. Stu Katz, I don't know if he's here, but he, was, he had been managing me. You know, I had started to ha have some... We'll say managing you in a loose sense. Yeah. Well, he'd, on, yeah, on a long <laughs> leash. Long leash. But um, so I started to have some heart failure symptoms, but, um, you know, that wasn't on um, optimal medication. Once we kind of got that set, I seemed to be doing fine again. And, um, but it was always the dysrhythmias with this disease, you know, the dysrhythmias are kind of what kill people mm -hmm. more than heart failure. Um, so it's sort of the pump in the electrical part, and both are affected by the disease. So um, anyway, so it, it was like, you know, a lightning bolt. Um, it was very clear that this now, now was the time because I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to continue to be lucky. And you know the situation with respect to heart transplant, tough to get. What yep. are you thinking? Yeah, well, so there, there is sort of, or there was, so, there, you know, my, my wife always says, you know, you were catching this heart, like it, everything was working towards, all the energy was working towards getting this particular heart, you know, at this particular moment in time. That's what she thinks. So, um, but there's a, there's a lot of truth in all that. But we are about to have a new allocation system, okay, which probably wasn't going to help me. And um, there was uh, the, uh, in the old and, and allocation. just so they follow, so distribution of organs was Distribution of organs, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was very much tilted towards um, heart failure rather than dysrhythmias, although there was still a provision for that. But so there is. Um, you know, sort of a special category um, in the allocation system for people who are having life-threatening dysrhythmias, you know, who are having cardiac arrests with metronomic regularity. And um, so they hospitalized me sort of with, with that uh, justification. And then I told them, um, you know, I'll take um, a heart from um, heroin overdose with a needle in the arm and hepatitis high C. High risk, high risk. High risk and, you know, hepatitis C. And uh, Nader, my heart surgeon, called me at four in the morning, like two weeks later, and said, it was as if you had incarnated, you know, your donor. That's what we got for you. So that's why I was able to get it quickly. Um, it was probably so, an so organ that would have been discarded. Just to back up, so you got a heart from a 
high risk Hep C donor, or they knew that he had? No, he had. Not. Yeah. He he had hepatitis C. And that I was, got hepatitis C, and that so was I a pretty infected. new protocol. It is, yeah. It's a protocol that we. Well, first of all, our heart program just started last January. I was the 25th um, patient, and um, about the time we started that, um, when I was at Hopkins, we had started this program where we would use hepatitis C positive um, organs um, on a trial basis, um, and because now there are, um, there are pills that are nearly 100% um, effective at curing hepatitis C. It's one of the great medical miracles of our time. We've cured hepatitis C. So, um, yeah, so we were taking hepatitis C positive um, kidneys and putting them into hepatitis C negative patients who might not otherwise um, receive an organ, um, and then treating them. So, um, you know, we started doing that um, about a year ago. Well, I think we've done somewhere between 30 and 40 of those transplants here now across all the organs, but mainly in heart and lung. Did, did you, as you began to think, gee, someday soon I may need a transplant, are you thinking I'm going to do the high risk one? What made you think that? No, I just said I was open. I've been telling my patients, you know, who are in great need that this is what they should do, and I believe it, and, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm a lot of things, but <laughs> and I and I knew I was in trouble, and I knew that this was a way to, you know, get an organ sooner. So a lot of folks see this on TV. They see people running around with little coolers and zipping off to somewhere. Your donor was relatively local, I take it. Yeah, not too far away. Uh huh. Neighboring state. And you were sitting in the bedroom, and they call you up. No, and because they had here? admitted me, and and. Um, because of the life-threatening arrhythmias, they could admit me and enlist me as sort of the highest status. And did, uh, who knew? But you, I, you know, I'm sort of the size and the blood type and everything that you could wait a year. Uh huh. Right. So. Um, and, I, and who knew you were in here? Did you broadcast it widely? A few people need to know. Yeah, I was sort of need to know initially. I guess, I, you know, I don't know, does it need to know? Yeah. Students wander in and get the shock of their lives? Um, I guess. I don't really remember that. No? Yeah. I mean, there were some people who were very surprised. Um, the 15th floor was, you know, kind of surprised and worried. That's uh, dean administrators. Right. Um, all right, so you're in there, heart comes through, you get it. Tell me a little bit about you wake up and you're in the wonderful world of NYU Health. Yeah. No, I had, I had tremendous confidence in the team. I've been part of hiring, you know, virtually everybody. Um, and um, I knew that this was, you know, going to be great. I just was, I couldn't have been more confident. I wasn't frightened. I wasn't, I was just like, let's. Let's get it on, you know. Now, some people are going to say the biggest challenge after this is taking medicines and rehab and so on. What did you find the biggest challenge post-transplant? Um, well, it's, it's always about transitions. You know, so, you know, I was sort of this chronically ill, metastable person, like highly functional um, doing a lot of things for years, and I'd gotten used to that. And before that, I was like a very functional, normal person who didn't know he had a disease. And now, you know, I was a really, like, deathly ill in the sense that I could die any time person who was moving to another stage of transplantation. So it's those transitions that are always challenging because you, be, you become something different. Mm. And you've got to get used to that. And so, um, so I'd say that was the case. Now I'm, you know, now I'm a transplant patient, right? And I know what that's about, but I didn't know what that was like, right? Um, and then I was a transplant patient in the hospital, and then suddenly I was a transplant patient at home. And that transition was 
really something. Tell me a little about that. Well, um, it's overwhelming because even for you know somebody who knows the drugs and everything, you go from everybody doing everything for you to you know ten days later um, having to figure it all out yourself, and you know a whole table full of literally How many drugs a table full take? of drugs. About. I mean, in the beginning, right now, I take um, I don't know somewhere between thirty and forty pills a day. I get a biopsy of my heart on a regular basis where they put a catheter in your neck, go down and take little chunks of the inside of the heart. I call it taco meat and um, look at it under a microscope and make sure you don't have a rejection. So that happens, you know, it was every week for the first month and then every other week and that sort of thing. I'm about three and a, month, three and a half months out now. I just had one last Thursday. <coughs> so. Um, yeah, so there's a lot involved, right? And probably in the beginning, it was more like, I don't know, 70 to 80 drugs or something like that. I never counted them, but it's a lot. It's pretty overwhelming. Jen, how many is it? It's a lot. And, um, and so, you know, you've got to, like, keep it all together and do rehab. Um, it's amazing what you can uh, lose. What would you do for rehab? A cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, in the beginning, I just had to like. Treadmill or wandering around. Yeah, no, on a treadmill. It's a, and that was a cool thing because I, like, when I dropped dead like 30 years ago, it was on a treadmill, like when they were testing me, and I, and so I had avoided, you know, exercise like, cardiovascular exercise for 30 years, aside from, some things that I did, but, um, but anyway, so you know, now I could like run, that was crazy. Like now I can run, I can get on a treadmill and run. Mm. And I haven't done that. What's the, aside from that, what's the most satisfying sort of upgrade of your health post the transplant? Well, so there's kind of like two curves. Um, what I refer to is like the recovery from a big operation and the drugs and the side effects and you know everything that that involves. And then, like the return of good um, cardiac health, and it would took it was about I would say six weeks that the lines crossed, and I actually started to feel better than I had before the transplant, and um, now I feel great. So some of our students are going to say, "All right, you had many pretty close to death, if not death, experiences. You went through this massive procedure." What's the lesson to teach to the students? Yeah, there are many. Um, I think one of the things that, and it's probably not exactly the, what you're hoping for, but one of the things was like, that I really learned was how patients see their doctors, right? So it was like, how patients see me. Um, and, you know, what I would say is, like, one of the most important lessons I think I could impart that I learned the hard way was that you have to do everything as if it matters. Because you never know when it's going to matter, right? And so with patients, the way you interact with the patients and the things you say, they're hanging on those things. And you don't even realize, you're just, you know, it's the tenth patient you've seen that day. But you can say one thing to that person, it'll really screw them up. Or you can say one thing that will make all the difference in the world, or do one. I'll give you an example. So I, I, have, I got a cold a couple weeks ago, and um, it's coronavirus. How many people know exactly what the virus is that causes their cold? But they did a swab and everything. So, so I started to, you know, get the symptoms. And um, Jen Pavone, who's in the audience, on a weekend, call, text me and says, I was just thinking about you. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Right? Profound. This morning, um, so the culture you know, was done last Thursday when I was getting my biopsy. And somebody let our head of um, transplant ID, Sapna Mehta, know that you know, I had this virus. So this morning, I get an email. You know, I heard that you have this virus, um, 
And I want you to know that it's a, it's a virus that you know, causes one of the causes of the common cold. But in transplant patients, you can get pneumonia. And I just want to check in with you and make sure that um, you were OK. You didn't have a fever. You didn't have a cough, because this you know, can cause pneumonia, and it can be serious. And, um, and this is what my patients have found works well. Take mucinex and you know, um, uh, vape. Uh, vaporizer and th I mean it first of all the fact that she even thought about me and look it's not because I'm her boss right I, I know that because <laughs> I know what that looks like I know when somebody's doing something because I'm their boss and I know when it comes from their heart and this was from her heart that like made all the difference in the world. Now, I'll give you an example of the other side. So, you know, I love to operate. And, um, you know, I've spent my whole career operating as well as doing other things. But, and um, so one of the drugs that we take is called uh, tacrolimus. And the drug, and almost everybody causes a tremor. And for 95% of the people, who cares, right? It's a little, it's just like a nuisance. But for a surgeon, that's a big deal, right? So I've been kind of um, canvassing a lot of the people that I know, you know, at other institutions and that sort of thing to try to get ideas. And, and the heart team here has been helping me with that. Like, is there another immunosuppressive regimen that I can switch to? So I, I happen to be talking to one luminary, you know, in heart surgery. And I said, in the beginning of the conversation, I said, this is really important to me. You know, being a surgeon is a big part of my identity. I'm not ready to give up being a surgeon, right? So we talked for a few minutes, and then he said, you know, you, you may just have to give up surgery. You, you know, you, you probably, uh, that's, you know, maybe the best thing for you. Don't take a risk of your health and everything. So after I started the conversation by saying, this is really important to me, that's where the conversation went, right? That's what you shouldn't do, right? Because I had already overcome tons of things. And each time I was, this is what I'm going to do, and I, and I did it, right? When I had the defibrillator put in, they told me I couldn't do what I am doing. And um, I was watching Game of, the, Game of Thrones last night. I'm, I was late to that party, right? And probably um, a lot of you have forgotten it because it sort of started years ago. But um, I was watching the one where um, Jamie gets his hand cut off, his right hand cut off. And, and um, he says, my life's over. It's my sword hand, right? Um, and, you know, I've had my sword hand cut off a bunch of times. And I've always found a way to c come back, switch hands, right? And I, I'm confident that that's going to be the case now. Um, so that's not what, so I told him, like, what I needed. I needed solutions. I didn't need that sort of default, right? So anyway, next month, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the Mayo Clinic and talk to them about uh, a protocol that they have for switching patients to another regimen. And the folks here have been, like, the heart team's been super supportive. And they want to bring that here because, not because of the tremor, because it doesn't matter to most people, but it's also very kind to the kidneys. And we have some heart patients that, um, you know, have um, renal dysfunction and are going to need a kidney transplant, you know, if something doesn't change and the drug that tacrolimus causes that to progress. This other drug doesn't. So I'm super excited about that because, you know, in a way I'm going to be the subject of, you know, um, that new regimen and hopefully bring it here and we're going to have a bunch of our patients on it and that's great. I'm so excited. Anything I can do, anything I can contribute either as a doctor or a patient, I'm thrilled about. Anybody say anything to you as a friend, aside from this 
Think about giving up surgery that surprised you? Well, so it's, it's very interesting because, you know, we're doctors. We're, we're not supposed to have a, a medical problem or a weakness or, you know, we're supposed to be perfect, right? Like, we take care of patients. We're not patients. And so I think a lot of doctors who develop an illness are very secretive about it. They don't want their colleagues to know. And I always thought that, you know, I probably wouldn't want patients to know either because then, the, you know, who wants to, like, you know, see a doctor who, like, is, has an illness, right? Um, that's not sort of what we think about when we think about a doctor. But it turns out that the patients, so I, you know, uh, I've been seeing patients in clinic. I tell them they are, like, so excited it makes such a big difference in their day that you can see that, you know, they, they just light up. Um, and so I don't know ab about, you know, my colleagues. I, I, we'll see. Um, they've all, everybody's been super supportive and kind and everything, you know. But um, uh, it, it's, it is an interesting How'd process. How'd you do with the nurses? The nurses? Mm -hmm. the, the nurses. Anybody say, you know, I've been waiting for this for years, having him as a patient? No. No. My, my one son, you know, said, oh, so you're sort of like the undercover boss. <laughs> because, you know, the, the, um, the, the thing, so just to say something about nurses. So I mentioned Jen earlier. Um, you know, when you think, one of, one of the things that's been very clear to me throughout all this is that um, the nurses, the physical therapists, um, I had a, you know, terrible thing happen a year ago, and I couldn't speak or, you know, eat or drink or anything. So the speech therapists and everybody, like, um, you know, separating the doctors that takes care of a patient, like, in the moment, like, who's with you throughout the day, those are the people that have the biggest impact. Those are the people you rem remember the most when you leave the hospital. Like, they are the ones who comfort you, allow you to maintain your dignity, um, really care, care for you in a way that is profound. And, um, you know, the coordinators um, in my aftercare who are always, like, concerned and, and, you know, making sure that everything's okay. I mean. It's, it's humbling to even think about it. Um, and again, you know, for, for the nurses and the physical therapists and everything, you know, do everything as if, you, as if it matters because, you know, you, you'll never know when it, to that particular patient it's going to make all the difference in the world. Know anything about the donor? Did you want to? So, um, no, I mean, no, I don't know. I know that he died of a heroin overdose. He was 25 years old, and that's about all I know. <clears throat> so there is an opportunity to write a letter to the donor family. And um, so my wife, like, felt really strong as she wanted to write the letter. Um, and then there's an opportunity for them to respond in some way. Now, my brother, I have another brother who had a heart transplant 23 years ago. Um, when things didn't look that good, you know, in heart transplantation. It's come a long way. He's a dentist. He's still practicing. And um, he, met, he met his family. In fact, every year on the anniversary of his transplant, he gets together with the donor family. And they all listen to his heart with his stethoscope and everything. So he has this, like, ongoing relationship with his donor family. Um, but that's up to them, really. You know, not, a, not everybody wants that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So let me ask you one more thing, and then if you have a question, come up to one of the mics if you want to uh, ask something. But I was going to ask you this. Did you see any unexpected burdens, either for your wife, the kids? Anything happen that you thought, I hadn't expected that that was going to trouble them or burden them? I mean, it could be money. It could be time. I, anything like that? Well, 
I, I think for my wife, it was just the enormity, the responsibility. Um, and getting, you know, information, um, you know, like um, physical therapists and nutritionists and everything, all the do's and don'ts of transplantation, of eating, of, you know, being out in public and everything, she found that pretty overwhelming, as I think Alex would agree. Um, so, so that was, it was almost like too, too much information in a very short period of time. Did they scrimp on anything? Because they figured, well, you must know what's going on. Um, that's an interesting question. I think there are some things that they probably assume, but in other ways, um, they, you know, this, like, I don't, I don't do heart transplants. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of information can make you really dangerous, and I think sometimes they re realize that too. <coughs> that, um, you know, they keep an eye on me. And they also know that I'm the way I am. <laughs> and um, so I, you know. Well, I think we're getting to see the way you are in a way that's uh, both enlightening and uh, uh, important uh, for all of us to understand. So I'm not seeing anybody rush up to the mics, you shy NYU types. There comes one. Let me just say one thing before, um, before the first question. If you have children and you're trying to decide what to teach them, the number one thing that I would say that you should impart is resilience. Because you never know what's going to happen in your life. And if you're not resilient, you fall down. Right? And that was something that I think my parents, um, you know, really taught me, and then my father's death and everything that was involved in that, and sort of being my brothers were all gone, you know, off to college and everything. I had to take care of everything. My dad, you know, knew he was going to die, and he transferred all this information, taught me how to, you know, write the bills. Said, "Look, your mom's going to, you know, basically be incapacitated by all this." and you have to be the man of the house. And um, back when people said things like that. Um, so resilience is something that is so important. And that's what you need to have in order to you know, really keep going with all the things that life hands you. And everybody's going to be at a point sometime in their life when they're, when they're going to be handed one of those things. So, tell us who you are. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you know, uh, your open and candid discussion. I'm Gwen Quinn. Um, Hi, Gwen. So, you may have already answered this question with what you said as I was standing up here, but I didn't hear if you said you had HCM or just another form of CM. But um, if the technology has been available. Yeah, so um, so uh, we, you know, after my brother's death, he was an attorney. He had a, a lot of, um, you know, colleagues and friends who were of means, and we, our family started a foundation. And we, um, back then, you know, um, that was 30, 30 years ago. Um, again, very little, I have dilated cardiomyopathy, but um, there's very little known about genetics, and it was thought that it was a very small part of the cardiomyopathy pie. Turns out it's much bigger. Um, so we funded a bunch of um, laboratories um, that were looking you know, at, at different genes, and one of them found our gene. And so one day I got a call from a cardiologist who said, you know, I've got news for you. Um, you need to come in and talk. And um, wow, that was something. So, you know, basically it's kind of toxic knowledge, right, in a way, because, um, you know, I had three kids um, who, uh, you know, I shared genes with. I say that because now I have my fourth child, um, who's my wife's, um, genetically. 
And um, so, you know, I knew that probably chances were it's 50-50, that one or two, probably going to have it. And um, so, you know, everybody got screened, and my oldest son and daughter both got defibrillators placed. And uh, as I mentioned, two of my nieces, my brother dropped dead, his, his two girls. And um, so then they all got married like right at the same time. And I was like, I held this big family thing and I said, look guys, the, there is this technology now where we could get rid of this disease in this generation, you know? None of them wanted to do it. And they, they've all gone on to have children. So. Well, in lieu of uh, other questions coming out of the audience, I'll end with a final comment. So I didn't know this at all. I didn't realize that you'd received a uh, Hep C heart. I was actually the ethicist on the uh, NIH panel for that protocol. And uh, thought, yeah, we, we ought to approve that protocol. Sounds like pretty reasonable. We should be using those hearts. So it never occurred to me that I would actually meet someone who uh, got one of them. Yeah, it never occurred to me that I'd actually receive one. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I remember when one, one of my attendings, Niraj Desai, who was really the guy who, who, you know, moved this thing forward. He came up to me one day, came to my office and said, what do you think of this idea? I said, well, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> and I said, but, you know, we like crazy ideas, but I think, you know, maybe the drugs aren't quite there yet. And then within about two years, the drugs were there. And he got going. But I never thought, you know, that that would save my life. Amazing. Well, aside from exhibiting uh, the virtue of resilience and making sure that you take home the lesson that what you do matters in ways that you want to be sensitive to, I want to thank you, too, for being open and frank and enlightening. Uh, I hope you. Uh, got uh, a good deal out of the uh, conversation. This is a staggering experiment in uh, education. We've just had a whole hour without a single slide. I've never seen anything like it in the history of medicine. Um, but again, thank you so much, and let's give Bob a big round of applause. Thank you.